Line. Today we're going to bring you the first in a two-part series of videos to teach you how to play the advanced rules for PAX Emancipation. And before we go any further, I want to mention our fantastic sponsor, Board Game Co. This is a website where you can go and pick from a large selection of games to purchase from them, but you can also sell your games over there. You can also trade your games over there. Yeah, Board Game Co. is a great place to go if you're looking to adjust your collection, bring some new stuff in, get some old stuff out. Board Game Co. makes it easy to buy, sell, and trade your way into a better collection. So I'm very excited to bring this video to you. This is certainly one of the most complex, if not the most complex game that I have tackled on this channel in terms of teaching you how to play it. In this video, we're gonna teach you the setup for the game and some general ideas and kind of about the components. And in the second video, we'll go into the gameplay. So expect the second video to be a good bit longer than this one. This should give you a nice little appetizer for what's to come. So with anything else, let's get right down the table and I'll teach you how to play the advanced rule set for Pax Emancipation. Pax Emancipation is a game where one to three players represent one of three different abolitionist agencies on a joint quest to end slavery worldwide beginning in the 18th century. Pax Emancipation is a very complex game and so there is also a basic game variant which you see here on this side of these cards. And this can be helpful in learning to play. This variant strips out numerous rules allowing players to learn the general flow of the game and become familiar with some basic rules. However, in my opinion, the satisfaction and fun of the game suffers tremendously with this basic rule set. For this reason, I will be teaching the advanced rule set found on this side of the player cards. If you do choose to play the basic game before playing the advanced game, please do not make a final judgment of your enjoyment of the game without trying the advanced game as well. I played the basic game three times and began doubting if it was worth the time and effort to learn the advanced game. However, when I incorporated the advanced rules in my fourth play, I became hooked and now it has become a favorite game of mine. The Red Faction is the British Parliament and Colonial Imperialists. Their monopoly of sea power allows them to create marines, to fight slaver ships, anarchy, and embargoes. The green faction is philanthropists, merchants, and explorers. They enjoy a financial advantage when installing agents from their boards. The evangelicals and missionaries are the white faction. Unlike agents of parliament and philanthropists, missionaries are installed without barrier costs. While playing Pax Emancipation, it's important to keep in mind that if the text on a card contradicts the rulebook, then the card takes precedence. However, if a player aid contradicts the rules, then the rules take precedence. Now let's discuss the five different areas of play that you'll find in Pax Emancipation. The first is the finance board. Players will move financial agents downward to generate just enough gold to pay for each costly action and then can reset them using a fundraiser action. Choosing from among the two column market of East and West ideas, players will syndicate anti-slavery organizations to gain access to their ops. On the 10 card global map, each square represents 2 million slaves. Each circle represents an admin spot for placing a colonial, missionary, or trader, which enables westernization, suffrage, and literacy. Warships, which can be placed on sea borders, suppress slavers, anarchy, and blockades. Merchantmen, also placed on sea borders, establish underground railroads. Any chit or disc in a player's victory pile counts as one victory point at the end of the game, with the exception of the disease disc, which counts as three victory points. Throughout the game, players will create two public tableaus of overlapping cards like this. One is the Bill of Rights, the other General Will. Pairs of adjacent icons, as you see here, are called freedom pairs and indicate if an idea is qualified to be legislated. The game begins as a cooperative game, which will last generally seven to 10 rounds, after which players may optionally continue playing as a competitive game. 
the game may only enter this competitive phase if all players avoided their counter enlightenment. If one or more players did not avoid their counter enlightenment, then that player cannot count their victory points and the game ends where they're at. The counter enlightenments for each faction are as follows and can also be found at the top of their card. If there are more slavers on the board than red agents, then parliament scores no victory points. If there are more than 25 barriers remaining on spheres, then player green counts no victory points. And if there are fewer than 15 freedmen, then white counts no victory points. Let's take a closer look at the anatomy of the map cards. The starting side of the map cards represents serfdom, while the flip side represents the modernized version of that sphere. This is the name of the sphere. The serfdom side is in black, while the modern side is in white. This letter in the corner indicates if the sphere is considered east or west, in this case west. Any sphere with this symbol on it will start with a green disc. While the disc is on the card, the sphere is considered diseased. Borders are the gap between two map cards, and some borders will have ship icons, as you see here. This indicates a sea border, where slaver chits and ship tokens may be placed. A ship with a marine is a warship, and one without a marine is a merchantman. Each sphere has either one or two ports. The port itself is represented by this dot, and they're all named as well. Each port will have one admin spot and at least one slave square. The white squares found on a map card are the dissident squares. Now let's take a look at the finance board. These dots here and here indicate the position for one agent each for the player, so three starting agents in capital and three in wealth. No agents start in debt. These three boxes are the only gameplay elements of the finance board. A player's finance board is public knowledge at all times. A player's financial agents are only ever made up of pawns. Meeples and other tokens like this will never be placed on the finance board. The rest of the board is a player aid, which likely looks incredibly complex right now to you. However, once you are a bit more familiar with the rules, this aid should actually become very helpful. Now let's take a look at the idea cards. The top left corner of the card, as well as the back of the card, indicate whether it is a Western idea or an Eastern idea. This is the name of the idea here, and it also includes the approximate year or years in which this idea originated. This is the name of the pictured abolitionist. This is called a firebrand and is primarily used for placing revolutions in the market. This arrow indicates the card will shift from west to east as a result of cultural diffusion. Icons on the left side of the card here and here are impacts of this idea if it is legislated into a splay. Icons on the right side of the card are the ops this idea will make available to the player who syndicates it. Each idea has two freedoms in the corners used to determine if it can be legislated. The four freedoms are Comet, Candle, Feather, and Lock. Revolution cards represent a revolution on the road to modern times. There is one revolution card for each sphere, and each revolution card has two possible revolutions on it. Revolution cards are very similar to idea cards, but also have a few additional features. Each revolution card has one to four engagement circles, which is where players can place revolutionaries. On the left side of the card is the sphere associated with it, in this case Brazil and Europe. There is also a preview of the freedom icons found on the opposite side of the card. Also, this indicates this revolution is worth two points for the philanthropist if it is globalized into a splay like this. These chits are called barriers. Each barrier is labeled with a sphere on the top on the front of the chit and on the back of the chit as well. The back of the chit also lists how many barriers that sphere will start with. Red chits represent left-wing barriers, white chits are right-wing barriers, and purple chits represent embargoes. The dice featured on barriers are known as bloody dice. This black jagged collar around the bloody die indicates frustrated hate. The very first step in setting up the game is choosing which game variant the players will be playing. 
During this video, I'll be teaching the advanced cooperative competitive version of the game. However, with slight modifications, the game may be played with other included rule variants such as Cooperative Solitaire, the 1865 to 1917 variant, and the Malthusian variant. Player factions should be assigned randomly. However, if playing with less than three players, the red faction must be used. Each player is given their faction's finance board as well as six agents of their color. Three agents are placed in the capital box and three agents are placed in the wealth box. All remaining agents as well as meeples are placed into a common pool storing the unused tokens of all players. Position the 10 starting cards in a 2 by 5 matrix like this. Each of these cards represents one of 10 different empires. Leave a small amount of space between each card. Personally, I like to leave enough space so that the slavers are actually in between the cards without overlapping them. Once the map is laid out, begin placing the barrier chits next to each of their spheres. Once you've placed all the barriers, then place the slaver ships in each of the nine sea borders where they're marked. After all the slavers are placed in their appropriate locations, place the elephant in Europe with its trunk pointed toward London. Divide the 18 black anarchy discs equally among the players. So in a three player game, each player will get six. These go in each player's victory pile and will be worth one victory point each at the end of the game. So in a way, the players begin with six victory points in a three player game and nine victory points in a two player game. Where indicated by these small red, white, and green dots, place the associated agent on that admin spot. These represent the British Parliament in London, a British colony in Virginia, Jesuit reductions in Brazil, and the EIC in Mughal. These are placed even if that faction is not being used in the game. Players then place in the red, green, and white squares the associated Freedman. All Freedmen at the beginning of the game are located in Europe. Then on each of these symbols place a disease disc. Any remaining tokens go into the common pool. Next, players should prepare the idea decks. Shuffle the Western ideas first and deal 22 cards into a deck for a three-player game or 16 for a two-player game. Then shuffle the Eastern ideas and deal them into a deck of the same size. These two decks should be placed side by side with the Western deck to the left of the Eastern deck. All remaining idea cards will not be used during the cooperative portion of the game. Next, flip both decks face up so that players will be able to see what ideas are coming up. Deal six columns from the west and six columns from the east to form two columns face up. These 12 cards below the draw deck are the market. The draw decks themselves are not part of the market. Make sure all cards are always oriented in the same direction so that the cultural diffusion arrow is always pointed to the right. Place the two starting splay cards, Bill of Right and General Will, side by side. In the actual game, you'll need to make sure there's plenty of room beneath them because these splays will begin growing downward as the game continues. And then place all revolution cards nearby as well. The stack of revolution cards may be examined by any player at any time. And now that the setup is complete, it's time to start the first round with player red. And there you go, that's everything you need to know to set up Pax Emancipation. Like I said, the other video should be coming to you that, uh, based on my work schedule probably the next couple of weeks. It's already scripted, but I still have to film it. So the scripting is really the, the hard part. The filming and editing still takes a good bit of time, but we'll see what we can do. I'm hoping to get to you very soon. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. You can find me on Twitter at Board Offline. These shirts, I have a coupon code in the description below for Mr. Meeple where you can get these shirts for 15% off. That's good till the end of this month, I believe. So go over there and try to use that. And until next time, if you're Board Online, Board Offline.